Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government. Welcome and today joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Acting Health Officer for Montgomery County, as well as Dr. Earl Strader, who is Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, Sean O'Dano from the Department of Health and Human Services, and also joining us today, we have two members of uh, the Maryland Legislative Body, Maryland Delegate Mark Corman and Maryland Senator Craig Zucker. They're here to talk about the recent legislative session. And the way we're going to do the format today, the county executive is going to do his opening remarks, toss to Mr. Corman and Mr. Zucker. And the members of the media, we can have some uh, question and answers for them before they need to exit. And then we'll have the public health update. So with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Good morning, hope you're doing well. Uh, good morning, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Before we get into our COVID update, I wanna thank Senator Zucker and Delegate Corman for joining us to provide us with their thoughts and summary of this year's General Assembly session. I was in Annapolis on Monday and I was pleased to be able to extend my thanks and gratitude to all the members of the Senate and House delegations that I met when I was down there. Um, under the leadership of the delegation chair, Senator Kramer and Delegate Corman, and the efforts of the 32 member delegation, it resulted in $287 million of new state capital investments that would be directed to projects located within the county. That number is pretty incredible. This is in addition to the $1.2 billion in state aid to support Montgomery County Public Schools, our libraries, and our public safety efforts. And it's in addition to our being able to work out with the state um, how the county gets reimbursed for school construction, which is actually going to make our school construction dollars go farther. So there's a lot to be happy about. Uh, John F. Kennedy uh, was quoted as saying that the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. And this is exactly what the General Assembly did this year, and it's historic state budget surpluses. Uh, this, this year, the General Assembly moved important legislation on combating climate change, banning ghost guns, protecting reproductive rights, increasing access to family and medical leave, and expanding the right to collective bargaining, as well as protections for prevailing wage. I was pleased to see that there was finally progress on cannabis legislation that will allow uh, voters to make the choice to legalize cannabis during the uh, in, during the general election with a ballot initiative, uh, ballot measure. Uh, the war on cannabis has been a failure for generations, and there's a need to do better in all aspects of policy, from business development to criminal justice. And the legislation that was passed is going to create a more equitable and fair system. And I'm glad that the Maryland Makerspace Initiative Program passed. Makerspace programs allow for a new generation to discover a new passion, industry, and career. And this legislation is really important. I had the privilege and pleasure of going up to Baltimore to visit their maker spaces and was really astounded at OpenWorks and what they've been able to achieve and thought that would be a great model for the county and this legislation should help us uh, join the ranks of uh, people like Baltimore have really innovative programs. So before we go into our COVID briefing, I'm going to turn this over to Delegate, Delegation Chair Corman and Senator Zucker, and they're going to answer any of your questions about the session, and then we'll return back to the regular COVID briefing. Senator, why don't you go ahead so we avoid a constitutional crisis? <clears throat> Um, I think it just uh, illustrates, Delegate Corman, how well you and I uh, work together in terms of whoever wants to go first. Uh, but uh, Chairman Corman, it's always a good day when I'm on a Zoom with you. Uh, I just wanted to take this moment also to salute uh, Senator Ben Kramer, the chair of the Senate delegation, as well as uh, really every member of the Montgomery County House delegation and Senate delegation. Uh, county Executive, I want to thank you and the County Council uh, for your leadership. Uh, quite frankly, we were uh, sent in with a specific uh, goal this session, and that's to systematically deliver for Montgomery County in a meaningful way. Uh, you all gave us your list of priorities, and we fulfilled every one of your priorities, and then some. Uh, we came into this uh, legislative session 
uh, with a countywide approach that there would be no part of the county that wouldn't feel the benefits of the capital budget and operating budget. And we delivered on that, whether it was um, in a meaningful way, helping out our local parks. Um, we were all shocked and horrified by the, by the explosion that happened in the Littonsville area of Silver Spring. So we went ahead, uh, the delegation, and fully funded the, re the uh, rebuilding of that park. Uh, Rosemary Hills and Lintonville Park for $800,000. That's going to be built right across the street from that apartment complex. Or uh, whether it was working as a delegation to make sure that nine uh, public schools uh, in the county that have the highest free or reduced uh, meal students are going to get new playgrounds at their local, at their, um, at their public school. Uh, we also uh, doubled down on community safety and public safety, making sure that from Glen Echo to uh, Laytonsville, that we're helping out our uh, first responders uh, or whether it was a police barrack in Rockville. Uh, we also, and, and this is where really a delegate Corman is, has been a, a leader as well in terms of transportation, but we had record investment in transportation. I'll let delegate Corman get a little bit uh, more in the weeds on that. But, um, you know, one of the things that um, the Montgomery County delegation does well is um, we work quietly. We don't, we don't make splashy headlines when we're in session, but we work quietly to deliver. So uh, as of July 1st, uh, the check will be in the mail, uh, not only for the state parks, not only for community, uh, not only for, um, you know, our, our um, public safety, but, um, but also um, our economic development treasures, whether it's a uh, white Flint, uh, whether it's a uh, rebuilding the uh, shopping center uh, in Burtonsville, or whether it's supporting our arts and humanities from roundhouse to, uh, to the only theater. Um, we also we also uh, received uh, we also achieved a lot of successes around the operating budget, which we don't talk much about. Where it's uh, the actual functioning of hiring staff, where we're able to deliver more than five million dollars for the universities in Shady Grove. We're also uh, able to get uh, we will be able to get about twelve hundred uh, kids and and uh, youth off the autism waiting list. Those uh, children who have autism are, are waiting for services and. The, the waiting list is normally 10 or more years. And based on the work of this delegation and our colleagues across, uh, across the Maryland General Assembly, uh, we will uh, be able to get about 1,200 of those children off the waiting list into service. And that, and why do I bring that up is because primarily the, the biggest population of those children on the autism waiting list are from uh, Montgomery County. Uh, we also helped our local businesses as well, whether it's promotion of our local farm breweries, our distilleries, our wineries, where we're now having uh, advertising outside of Maryland and, and Virginia and West Virginia and Pennsylvania to get uh, folks here. And, uh, and we uh, provided uh, more big tax relief for uh, working families, for retirees, and even helping those uh, uh, Marylanders and Montgomery County residents with children providing uh, just record uh, tax credits for child care providers and others. But this really was, um, the success of everybody in Montgomery County with the support of our uh, elected officials throughout the state. But really, this was a session county executive uh, that we uh, delivered for Montgomery County. And I appreciate your partnership, appreciate the county council's partnership, and certainly uh, the great teamwork and uh, teammates in the House of Delegates as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to that one of those teammates, uh, just a great, great elected official, great public servant, uh, Delegate Mark Horman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Zucker is, uh, he, he may act like he's quiet, but he works very hard for the county uh, and is the chair of the Capital Budget Subcommittee in the Senate, which is why we were so well positioned to deliver on all these successes, along with the great work of the Senate delegation chair, uh, Ben Kramer. Uh, it's truly been a remarkable year for the entire Montgomery County House and Senate delegation. We're 32 members strong. We're the largest delegation uh, in the state legislature. Uh, and over on the House side, we have some really incredible leaders. We have one of the six standing committee chairs in uh, Chair Kumar Barve, the House Majority Leader, uh, Delegate Eric Lukey, the House Parliamentarian, Delegate Janelle Wilkins, uh, the Vice Chair of the Judiciary Committee, Delegate David Moon, and the newly announced Vice Chair of the Health and Government Operations Committee, my seatmate, uh, Delegate Ariana Kelly, who was just named to that post late on uh, Monday nights. So we have some incredible leaders, and you see that out on the House floor, where we're leading on all those major issues of the county executive uh, discussed climate solutions, reproductive health, uh, cannabis, family and medical leave, uh, ghost guns. Those are all Montgomery County legislators who are on the floor propelling those uh, priorities uh, forward. Uh, the delegation took up 30 local bills this year, over half of which are now awaiting uh, action 
uh, by the governor, ranging from live streaming of our park and planning meetings, various alcohol licensing bills, uh, and reforms to our business improvement district uh, creation process that I know has been a big issue uh, in the county. Uh, and we also, and I don't want to repeat too much of what Craig said, but really uh, fiercely defend, uh, frankly, our parochial interests. That's part of why we're sent down there to deliver for Montgomery County. Um, we really were able to craft uh, uh, an incredible $27 million per year uh, bus rapid transit continuous funding program uh, that Montgomery County will uh, benefit from on top of the record year uh, in the capital budget that, uh, that Craig so well described. We got over $63 million in one-time support for the county's bus rapid transit plans, over $8 million for zero emission buses, uh, over $10 million for county parks, $10 million for white Flint area improvements, uh, and millions more for other uh, priorities. Uh, we also passed a mark rail uh, bill to further uh, plan improvements on the Brunswick line for the commuter rail uh, service there, uh, ensured our school operating funds uh, were, were met, that we were getting what we were owed under school, uh, school funding, uh, got specialized operating funds, as Craig said, for the universities at Shady Grove uh, for the first time, both in, in this year's budget and then uh, through legislation uh, next year, continued the absolutely critical uh, Purple Line Business Impact Grant programs, and as the county executive said, reform the school construction program to ensure Montgomery County can access uh, all the money we're always back here uh, talking about to improve our school construction funding program. And we did all this working hand in glove with the county executive, the county council, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, park and planning, uh, and of course, a lot of great staff. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, the, uh, the entire team Montgomery uh, effort that went into delivering all these great successes. And with that, Mr. County Executive, let me hand it back to you. So just, you know, thank you. Thank you guys again. I mean, I, I thought it was a really remarkable year and uh, you really did Montgomery County proud and you did a lot of important state legislation that isn't specific to Montgomery County. Uh, I'm just thrilled and, you know, working with you all uh, over this year was, was a really great experience. I felt like everybody was in sync. As you said, you were looking at every corner of the county to make sure that things came here that, that would affect and benefit everyone. And that's really important. It really fits with our equity mission to make sure that when we spend money in the county, we spend it equitably around the county. So again, thank you all very much. And uh, you guys get a well-deserved break now. And I hope you enjoy it and get some space. <laughs> Take care. Thank so you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I was wondering if the members of the media had any questions either for the delegate or the senator. Going once? I'll jump in here, Lorna. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Steve Bonnell, but that's to be. Um, bear with me, Senator Delegate. This is kind of a wonky question, but the county council is working through its police accountability bill and administrative charging committee bill. And my understanding, correct me if any of this is wrong, is that bill kind of got passed at the last minute uh, of session and there were two different versions that kind of were passed. Do any of you have insight on, including when the recruitment date for those boards, you know, whether that was extended or not? Do any of you have insight on whether that was rectified or kind of where that stands? So Steve, I, what I'd really like to do is put you in touch with uh, Delegate Moon. He's the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee and, and we'll be able to answer your question. I do not believe they extended uh, the date of the creation of those uh, boards, but Delegate Moon can give you a lot more insight and detail. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to uh, follow up with you after this to, to connect you with them. The only other, thanks, uh, Delegate. The only other question I have is obviously we're all interested to see what happens with the state legislative map. Um, and I believe that one of the kind of core issues in the map uh, has to do with your kind of neck of the woods, Senator Zucker. So I want to give you a chance to respond, you know, this might change kind of the jurisdiction you represent, depending on what plays out. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, obviously, it, it's interesting to be kind of caught up in the middle of that, obviously. So yeah, I mean, I, look, I think uh, we'll have a decision soon. Um, the reason why uh, some of uh, another count and, and now with Senator Hester's district is coming into Montgomery County a little bit is based on population growth from everything that I've seen. Uh, the northern part of Montgomery County isn't really an issue with what I've heard regarding uh, legislative redistricting, but looking uh, looking forward to getting some uh, finale on on uh, where the legislative district maps are. But 
mine is, you know, Delegate Corman, myself and others is just going to be getting to work anyway. You know, we're going to be uh, uh, reaching out to uh, constituents. Uh, we can continue to reach out to constituents to make sure they knew what we did in Annapolis and see where else we can be helpful. But I think I think this should be resolved uh, this week and we'll have uh, some clarity. Are you concerned, frankly, about if the district's redrawn a different way about your chances um, this fall? I guess this just in any regard. Look, I think, uh, you know, we can, we can sit here all day and talk about hypotheticals. Uh, bottom line is, is that uh, right now, this Montgomery County delegation delivered uh, record funding, record programs, uh, and incredible legislation. And I think it's a moment where uh, we did our job and we did our job well. And uh, we just got to keep looking toward the future on where else we can be helpful. And, you know, look, uh, thinking about hypotheticals just won't get us anywhere. We just need to be present and uh, look to see where we can continue to be uh, helpful in the future. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. I believe we do have another set of questions for uh, Kate Ryan for the delegate and the senator. Good uh, morning, Kate. Good from morning. The TOP. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Um, uh, to both of you, uh, Senator Zucker and, and Delegate Corman, uh, in, in terms of the sustainability of the tax breaks we have here, how much of that was a result of federal funding uh, playing a role, you, you know, thanks to COVID, et cetera? And how sustainable is that? And second question, gas tax holiday. Um, I know people have been enjoying getting a bit of a break at the pump. Um, there had been uh, pressure from the comptroller to, to give it a 90-day uh, extension. Is there any chance of that happening? And how much is that costing us each month? So those are the questions I have for you. And who's going to take it? Uh, Corman, do you want me to start? Go ahead. Okay. So um, in terms of um, the tax breaks and the tax relief we gave Marylanders, uh, that's going to be an ongoing basis. Uh, a lot of that was achieved by um, both uh, our help with federal money, uh, also uh, revenues doing better than we thought, and quite frankly, just good budgeting. Uh, by the legislature, making sure that we were tightening our belt, making sure that we were keeping an eye on every every dollar that was coming in. Um, the, it's going to be, uh, we budgeted for the out years, so it's uh, we understand what it would do for us structurally, meaning we understand the money, the money coming in, the money coming out, but uh, this was part of the negotiation we have with the governor. And I think we're, I think we, uh, we the General Assembly provided great leadership in terms of, um, making sure that we're providing tax relief for working families and retirees. Uh, in terms of uh, the gas tax holiday, um, look, this was really uh, Maryland General Assembly led. Um, we, uh, we are providing tax relief in other ways that's meaningful. I think right now we need to keep an eye on uh, where we are with the Transportation Trust Fund, because if you're taking money, if, if you're um, providing um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out of uh, somewhere, but that's certainly something that the governor could look at and figure out what, what he wants to do on it. But uh, we're no longer in session right now. Uh, so we just want to make sure that we're continuing. We want to make sure that uh, the tax relief that we've already provided uh, is utilized. Yeah, I'll just to add, Kate, that the sustainability of the tax relief is a huge concern, which is why we can't just adopt every um, tax cut that people propose when uh, the balance sheet looks flush. Uh, which is what some uh, folks would like us to do. That's why it was so carefully crafted to try to target those uh, most in need, um, the retirees with making certain levels of income, uh, as well as some of those real essential goods like diapers that, uh, that people on fixed incomes uh, have a hard time uh, paying for. On the gas tax holiday, it's about $100 million a month. Uh, that's not going into transportation infrastructure investment. Uh, for the 30 days that we did, the deal was that the governor came in with a supplemental budget, as we call it, to backfill that money with um, non-gas tax dollars. Uh, the governor did not express uh, or, or signal to us that he would be uh, coming in with additional supplemental budgets to backfill if we extended the holiday. Uh, and you know, as much as uh, people are hurting from gas prices, they also need potholes filled on their roads. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough balance, uh, but this, was, uh, this is where we ended up with the 30 days. Gotcha, thank you very much. And just so I can clarify the retirees, for example, that, that tax break, um, which I'm certain is is more than welcome. That is a five year plan. Do I have that correct? No, no. That is no, it's ongoing. What? 
you, where you may have gotten the five years, that's how we usually do our budget is in five year cycles, like five year outlook, but, um, but this is ongoing. Okay, got it. Listen, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kate. Gentlemen, I believe we do not have any more questions for you. Thank you for joining us today. And with that, let's move forward with a public health update. Who's going to take it? The county executive? I'm going or... to start. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. So, so I want to thank the chair and the senator for joining us again. And uh, as for our COVID update this week, the county's current case rate continues to increase and is approximately three times higher, higher than where we were one month ago and as high as the county peak rate during the Delta surge last August. So we're seeing a lot more cases as the shorthand. 85% uh, of the cases we're seeing are the BA2 subvariant, and Montgomery County's case rate has risen faster than the rest of the state. Even though we still remain in the CDC low community level, our neighbors in Arlington just increased into the medium level. Um, our schools are out on spring break this week, and many of our residents are gonna be traveling and gathering with their friends, and we know that, and they're going to be, you know, celebrating Ramadan, Passover, and the Easter holidays. As I mentioned last week, our projections are showing that we're going to see these cases like likely to worsen, the trend to worsen for the next few weeks before they potentially level out and then start declining again. And all the all of the assumptions are this follows a similar pattern to Omicron of a ramp up and a ramp down. The good news is that our hospitalization rates remain low, but we're, we're going to monitor them closely over the coming weeks as we weather this increase in transmission. I we're fortunate to have a highly vaccinated population. Currently, 88% of the total population is fully vaccinated. And as you can see from this chart, our additional doses have increased dramatically now over the past two weeks as our 50 and older population has shown up for their second booster. We need everyone who hasn't gotten the first booster shot to go out and get this booster. It's offered at many places, and we continue to have county-operated clinics that provide both types of vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, as long as the supplies are available. As our 5 to 11 pediatric race vaccination rate is projected at 62% fully vaccinated, this compares pretty favorably with a CNN review of U.S. county vaccination rates in calculating that less than 28% of this age range is vaccinated nationwide. So we've got more than twice as many vaccinated, but it also means we've got a, a lot of people who aren't vaccinated. But this is good news and it's very important. A study was published last week by the New England Journal of Medicine. They found the vaccination is a key factor in preventing hospitalization. Um, the researchers found that vaccination reduces the risk of hospitalization for 5 to 11-year-olds by 68% during the Omicron wave. And so this continues to be something we've been telling people pretty consistently that the biggest benefit um, is from the vaccines and the boosters is keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you from more serious forms of the illness. So you may get a light case or a breakthrough cases, some people refer to it, um, but what you don't want are the serious cases that have um, very difficult consequences for people. I want to thank our HHS team as well as all of our community partners for their continued effort to get our um, county in vaccinated and boosted. Over the coming weeks, HHS is going to be holding virtual community conversations with five, five of our regional service centers, and tonight the series begins with an East County conversation starting at 7 p.m. I just want to reiterate how critically important all of our partners were in getting this done successfully. They played such a major role in making sure that people got tested and got vaccinated. And it would, all of this would have been much more difficult without the partnerships we've had. I want to take a moment just to express my gratitude to East County Regional Service Center Director Jeru Bande. Over the last two years, Jeru has been at the epicenter of our very comprehensive response to COVID in this part of the county. He's a big reason why our outcomes with lower income as well as our immigrant communities have been as equitable as they are. And uh, his work and the work of his team in the East County really deserves to be noted. I'm pleased that the federal government has launched the Test the Treat initiative and we're working to get the word out about this. COVID treatments 
are another tool to help us combat COVID and reduce severe cases and increased hospitalizations. But these treatments must start early to work. Um, COVID medications are now available through doctors and local pharmacies. And if you have COVID-19 symptoms, don't wait to get treated. I'll just relate my own personal experience of trying to get a doctor's appointment. And by the time I got my doctor's appointment and determined that um, I definitely had COVID and I could get treatment, they told me, well, I was on the sixth day and you can only take the treatment up to the fifth day. So I didn't get the treatment and I wound up with 13, 14 days of COVID, probably longer than it might otherwise have been. Um, not a severe case, but a certainly longer case than I anticipated. So there's real value in this. And with these being available through doctors and local pharmacies, there are gonna be some places where they can actually test you. And if you test positive, give you the medications there. They can fill out and produce the prescription and they've got medications on site. Not all places do, I believe. Uh, we're gonna put on the update, uh, put an update on our website so you could find the places that can both test and treat. On another note, over the last month or so um, on this briefing, the Police Accountability Board has come up for questions and I wanna thank Dr. Stoddard for all his work and transparency on this process. Last Wednesday, we launched the application portal for our newly formed Police Accountability Board and our Administrating Charging Committee. And while we're still waiting for the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission to publish its regulations, on these important boards, we knew that we needed to move forward to meet the July 1st timeline that's established in state law. And so we're encouraging members of the public to apply for these important boards. And we're gonna put the application um, link in the chat as well. Uh, I just want people to know that, you know, we are talking to the, uh, to the state to make sure they are not more restrictive um, than people want this to be. They're, this has been an ongoing concern about what regulations come down from the Standards Commission versus what the expectations of the community are. And we are lobbying very heavily that we want the regulations to reflect the expectations and not appear to undo uh, the work that was done to get us to this point. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be uh, delivering my third county, State of the County Address from the Silver Springs Civic Center at noon. I'm gonna be talking about the upcoming 23 budget recommendations, as well as our progress on COVID, combating climate change and creating more affordable housing and expanding transportation and economic development efforts. I'm also gonna discuss our plan to address learning loss in our schools, as well as public safety concerns. Uh, the address is gonna be streamed online and we're strongly recommending that everybody who comes there wear their masks at this indoor event. Uh, in fact, you know, I, we're at the point now where nobody, we're not mandating it, but I think all of us feel very strongly that if you're indoors, and particularly if you're indoors at a crowded place, you absolutely should be wearing a mask. These cases are rising. They're on the same kind of steep curve now that looks like the last Omicron had. We don't anticipate winding up in the same place, but we do know that it's going to spread more. And... Uh, Anything you can do to protect yourself and wearing masks is still, other than a vaccine, it's the primary way you can protect yourself. So tomorrow we're gonna to recommend that people wear them. Uh, we recommend if you come into a county building, particularly libraries where you have a number, large number of people congregating, that you wear masks inside. We hope people will do this voluntarily, but it's in your best interest and the best interest of the people around you. So I hope, all of you will take heed. This county has been really good at listening uh, to the advice from health experts. And, you know, this is what they're telling us now. And, you know, Philadelphia moved to a mask mandate. We've seen Arlington move into medium uh, as a medium level county. And we would like to uh, stay as low on those uh, rankings as possible. And so I'm going to thank you all, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Bridgers, Sean, and Dr. Stoddard for their updates. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Happy to join you again uh, for your uh, weekly press conference. I have no uh, additional comments. Um, I'll turn it over to Mr. O'Donnell and be available uh, for question and answers from the press. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers.
Okay. So again, our, our county dashboard is uh, continuing to track and provide daily um, information uh, as it comes in through our, our state partners or through the CDC sources that have been linked to the dashboard. Uh, of course, the three primary measures the CDC uh, is recommending are tracked across the country are the case rates and the hospitalization uh, utility uh, utilization for COVID. Um, our, as the county executive mentioned, our case rates are uh, progressing while our hospitalization rates have remained low. Um, one additional point to add on, uh, it is true that our current case rates are um, similar to the peak of our Delta in Montgomery County. One thing to note, Montgomery County did have a, a lower uh, uh, peak case rate for Delta than many of our, our neighboring jurisdictions. Um, and we're, we believe that a lot of the co contribution for that was the effectiveness of the, the vaccinations, the primary doses of vaccinations for helping to suppress Delta case rates and the high vaccination rates in our county. Um, we know that during Omicron, both of these sublineages um, are more likely to have breakthrough cases for, for those with primary vaccinations. And again, our, our, while we certainly want to reduce case transmissions, our emphasis is to prevent as much uh, serious illness as possible. And uh, we're continuing to stress the importance of staying up to date with those vaccinations to reduce that serious illness. Um, to go into greater detail on hospitalizations, we currently have 28 uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Our, uh, our acute care has increased slightly um, with four additional from, um, from this time last week, um, and our ICU bed occupancy has uh, remained about the same. We haven't seen this go up yet, um, but we do believe we're likely to see some hospitalizations um, subsequent to the increased number of cases. Uh, we're not certain exactly how, how high that will rise though. Again, we're continuing to, uh, to track deaths related to COVID. Um, you know, so far in April, we haven't seen an increase in those death rates. Um, we're still seeing the tail end of the previous Omicron surge. Uh, we, we keep sharing this with, with our uh, community partners and we, we hope that this can get emphasized out to the community, we think it provides a pretty, um, pretty easy to understand uh, recommendation for how impactful the boosters are at preventing death um, and how impactful it is to be vaccinated to, to help keep you out of the hospital. Uh, again, um, I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Hudson has shared the links for the test to treat sites. Of note, when you go to that site, there are two, uh, when, when you expand your search, uh, you should be able to see two boxes, one that lists pharmacies that are car carrying antivirals that you can go with a prescription. Um, those are, there's far more pharmacies that are in, of that nature. However, there's still a, uh, a good number of test to treat locations that are one-stop shops. If you're, if you're symptomatic, go to that site, get tested. You can get your prescription filled right there, which uh, certainly uh, we think is an easier way for people to uh, get medication for their for COVID if they're diagnosed. Uh, to, to share with a little more information about um, how we're how we're looking uh, at our rising cases, uh, we've been looking globally at other uh, parts of the world and what's going on with COVID, as well as uh, some nations that have had similar curves as us. We see globally. Um, on average, COVID, is, uh, COVID case rates are, are declining for much of the world. A couple locations of note with increases are Argentina and Mexico, um, who have seen increases over the previous week. Uh, as a country, we haven't seen that, but obviously we're seeing that in some um, jurisdictions, particularly in, in more densely populated places. Um, uh, so far, so we're tracking on this to see see where it goes. It may be that uh, the Americas have a similar um, uh, BA two uh, bump that Europe experienced. Looking, we've looked at some individual countries in Europe, and you can see, even with relative proximity, there is some uh, difference to how this played out, um, particularly in Germany and in Spain. 
Uh, the United Kingdom, which has most closely uh, um, predicted where uh, the U.S. as a nation, where our cases go, um, and Dr. Fauci has mentioned that as well, uh, we see that they had a second uh, Omicron surge uh, following the first surge, and it took about three to four weeks before they reached the peak of that surge, and then they started to come down. France um, appears to have a, a similar curve as that, uh, and we're taking, um, we, we believe that that, it may be predictive of what we see. Um, notably in the UK, uh, those, um, those levels were fairly significant, even for the second surge, but nowhere near as high as that uh, first Omicron phase. Um, we're hoping that ours are, are reduced as significantly as well. And again, we don't expect uh, to have a, a peak as high, high as the Omicron phase in, in December and January. Uh, following up on where we are with vaccinations, as the county executive mentioned, uh, we are now at 88% fully vaccinated uh, of all ages. Um, we are seeing that most of the movement obviously related to uh, sec second dose boosters, um, but we also are now at uh, approximately 62% uh, or so um, uh, estimated for our 5 to 11 being fully vaccinated and continue to work with our MCPS partners on clinics. Um, we took a, a pause uh, this week while they're on spring break, um, but we have some plans in the works to uh, work with them as locations when the under five population becomes eligible. Um, we'll work with MCPS to, to host some clinics uh, for that age group. Uh, because the uh, the the most recent guidance for second dose boosters uh, is, is particular now to the 50 and older population. Uh, we've split out in our pulse report an additional age group to look at dose rates by race and age. Um, so now we have a, a group that's specific to 50 to 64 and um, as well as the 65 and above. Again, we are, we're looking to increase the rates of both of these groups even though uh, 50 to 64 is at 70% and the 65 and above is at 78%, um, we particularly are trying to increase messaging and communications with our Latino populations and our African-American populations um, to ensure that they're aware of, of the, the uh, declining protective effect of the primary doses and how important it is to stay up to date and get those boosters to protect themselves against uh, current and future surges of, uh, of COVID. Uh, just to share the, the volume of uh, what we're seeing, we have seen testing go up a little bit. Um, we have seen, uh, obviously, our vaccinations go up at our sites quite a bit. Um, we're continuing to work with our state partners to try to get uh, some additional vaccine to do more of these boosters. Um, but obviously there's quite a few places where people can get boosters now. So we do encourage uh, folks to uh, look at look at the options, go to someplace that's convenient. And again, if they're 50 and above, or if they meet the immunocompromised eligibility, come out and, and definitely get the first booster if they haven't. Um, but if they, uh, if they have and they're eligible to get the second booster. Uh, just want to again, remind folks that we also have the, um, we are also continuing to distribute uh, N95 masks and uh, rapid test kits through the libraries. We, the county is distributing about 20,000 uh, rapid test kits and a little bit more than that of masks every week to the population. Um, we also have uh, six locations, um, five of them at rec centers and one at Dennis Avenue where people can pick up a, uh, a take home uh, PCR kit, complete it, and then bring it back. And we're, we're suggesting that people pick those up um, uh, around the time when they're going to do the test, uh, mostly because we have uh, a limited supply and we would rather that they, they pick them up and when, they, when they're going to do that test. Um, but that is certainly another option in addition to coming to one of the county sites. So uh, that's all the updates I, I have for right now. Um, happy to uh, turn it over for questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, Mr. County Executive, I believe you need to leave by noon this afternoon. Um, 
So any other presentations from uh, Dr. Stoddard? No? All righty, so let's get started with the Q&A portion of this. I believe Heather Curtis from WMAL Radio has questions. Good afternoon, Heather. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking the time out today. Um, County Executive, you spoke about Philly reinstating its indoor mask mandate. You said we'd like to stay as low as possible, and obviously our county has done very well in terms of COVID metrics compared to so many other places. Um, have there been any thoughts about a threshold that could trigger reinstatement of an indoor mask mandate in the county? Um, I would leave that to Dr. Bridgers or Dr. Starter to discuss. I mean, they're looking at the numbers, and I think everybody's sensitive to you just can't let this thing run up uncontrolled at some point. You're going to have to determine that it's not breaking where you want. But I'll let them uh, add to that if they wish. Sure. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. So, Heather, so there is no additional threshold based on our revised recommendations to um, implement CDC's community level transmissions that are low, medium, and high. But these are added, additive measures, I should say. And so while we don't want to plan for, uh, we are planning for medium and high risk, I'm sorry, we're planning for high, high, uh, medium to high risk responses. These are additive, so we will build upon that through education, testing, notification, efficacy regarding mask wearing. I know that um, uh, Steve has asked many questions questions about those metrics as well. And so they aren't as they were previously noted for low, um, uh, medium, substan moderate, substantial, and high risk. But we are clearly monitoring the, the case counts. Our hospitalization rates are low. Uh, and so that's one indicator. Again, um, the CDC doesn't recommend that um, mask reinstatements be considered until they are high uh, community levels. But we're at low, and so we're planning for medium and high. We project that based on our modeling and Mr. O'Donnell uh, indicated through his presentation that we've done uh, multiple analysis regarding national and international trends. And we expect that we too will uh, reach our peak in a couple of weeks. So the next two weeks are very critical in the way we do our case analysis, looking at test positivity rates that are still low in this particular region as compared to the Northeast. And so the measure is 200. Uh, cases and we are below that, but we continue to monitor that. If you use the case analysis or case rate determination, we are at a substantial uh, uh, case rate in which we had off ramps and on ramps, but we're using those indicators and lessons learned from that. Public education is key. Efficacy, as uh, our county executive indicated, uh, public advisories to strongly recommend uh, indoor mask wearing. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell indicated last week, I believe, during the press conferences that we will look at those settings that are congregate spaces, schools, uh, spaces where uh, places where there are limited spaces uh, to make those recommendations while monitoring community level spread and transmission. The, the only thing I would add to that is, <clears throat> and we talked a bit about this this morning, actually, is um, the response that you would implement will vary by the strain. So with the Omicron strain, obviously, it tends to have higher transmissibility, but lower acuity than Delta, for example, by comparison. And so in that circumstance, you can be a bit more tolerant of cases than you would be in a setting where those cases translate into more hospitalizations or more sickness and death. And so in this case, I think, you know, the, the, the way we're looking at um, the, the Omicron surge is we really just want to be we don't want to let have it get out of hand. As kind of executive like said, there are other considerations around, but I, but I think in, in this kind of um, a variant, you want to have an escalating strategy, as, as Dr. Bridges alluded to, where initially you make some recommendations and you focus on areas of high concern, such as places where there are seniors, unvaccinated young people, et cetera. And then you move into increasing categories as the, if the cases continue to increase, you want to be able to have escalation stamp, you know, standards um, to look at. We are obviously paying a lot of attention to our test positivity because the other thing that we'll be we believe we will see is as cases if cases continue to increase, we'll see it translate into test positivity because I know one of the things that's been raised is a lot of rapid tests out there. How how do you know what you actually have? 
And what people are often doing in the community right now is using PCR testing as a confirmatory test to a rapid test. And so we expect that if, we're, if you see a high volume of at-home rapid test positivity, that will then translate into a test positivity increase because the people who are naturally selecting for PCR testing are those people who believe they are positive. And so we're not currently seeing that. So we know there's a baseline level of infection, but we're um, not at the point where we need to we believe we need to make a recommendation around a mask mandate because that positivity and hospitalization rate remain low. And are you concerned that after, you know, Easter and, you know, the Jewish holidays and Ramadan that people will be seeing a lot of their family members and we've seen in the past two years, family gatherings usually translate into more cases? Yep. It's definitely something I'm concerned about. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, I mean, we are, that's why we mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning, I talked about, you know, people being careful between the travel and the large gatherings. Um, we, we do worry because in the past, this has produced bumps. Hopefully it doesn't produce a bump or if it does, it produces not much of one, but we'll wait to see four or five days after everybody gets back. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I, I actually want to add a little bit to this. Uh, so, what, oh, sure. and, and Dr. Bridgers may, I'm sure this is something you would probably try and say, if you want to go ahead first, you're more than welcome to. Sure, as far as testing and vaccination, so we're looking at increased volumes, you know, early on, we saw post-Delta pre-Omicron, you know, our increases in testing and vaccinations, especially with the administration at our county-led sites regarding vaccinations. And so we're planning for that. We had a, 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 a uh, recovery plan that we um, are actually using real time to accommodate that. We want folks to come in and get tested. We want folks to get vaccinated and we prepare for that. Similar to uh, after the winter break, we saw an increased number of testing. We saw an increased number of cases and positivity rates as Dr. Stoddard indicated. And so we are planning for that. We anticipate that that will happen over the next two weeks. As I um, previously uh, uh, stated that our peak is about two weeks from now. And so we are anticipating all of those uh, variables into our uh, public health response. Dr. Starr, do you wanna add anything else? Yeah, to that? I, I, we obviously did see a surge in, in testing before spring break, which we believe is probably indicative of travel because people need to have the negative tests in, in many cases for travel. And so we do believe people traveled over spring break. We obviously didn't discourage it and we were fine with it. But obviously we, we are a bit concerned about what will happen, particularly in the school system after the spring break when people come back together after being separated across the country, traveling in, you know, both, you know, air and, and rail um, environments. So obviously we will be meeting with Montgomery County Public Schools at the end of this week, as we always do to discuss, we'll discuss with them sort of any concerns that they may have. Obviously they have provided a significant level of rapid tests home to people. So the thought process is that we're, we're obviously encouraging people who travel to take one of those rapid tests with, with their children when they get back. Obviously they should do that before they send their student back to school, just to make sure that we can minimize any impact that we're gonna see in our school system after spring break. But those are tools that we haven't had for previous uh, breaks or family gathering, obviously those rapid tests. And so obviously having them be able to, people know their status before they go back into the buildings is a, is a big plus for this time that we haven't had for previous returns to the school environment. For one piece, just to add to that, Dr. Sada, thank you for that um, um, reminder of our conversations with MCPS and um, the, the Maryland State Department of Education, or the Maryland Department of Health has um, revised or changed their metrics for identifying outbreaks, but we are in conversation. We are looking at those metrics as we did, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, um, post winter break to make recommendations should there be an increase. And so we've begun to have those conversations even before students return in anticipation. Again, we are specifically targeting the next couple of weeks to look at case counts, community spread, test positivity, and more importantly, the impact on our uh, hospitalizations and healthcare industry. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Heather. Um, Rebecca Tan, Washington Post, you had a couple of questions there. Maybe they were already answered, but do you have a um, follow-up? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, I, just, I just wanted to ask one question. So Dr. Sider, you talked about some of this already, but um, given you know the prevalence of at-home tests, how many people are testing positive at home? Sometimes they use a PCR test to, to confirm. Sometimes they just quarantine and get on with it. 
how is this affecting the county's surveillance mechanism? And this, this question is for Dr. Bridges as well. And how is the county confident that it has, you know, an understanding of, of the, the caseload and the case rate in the county? So thanks, Rebecca, for that. Go ahead, Dr. Sada. Go ahead. Go ahead. And no, then, no, no. You're, and you're the health officer. You, you go first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, actually, um, based on our conversation this morning, so great question, Rebecca. Um, we initially, when we started deploying more rapid tests in the community, we built a portal and we linked that with our, uh, with the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell and his team were very instrumental in doing that so that we can have a better representation and have more accuracy in the case reporting. We've been working with our clinicians in the county to assist them with reporting. They've had that our patients come to them as well. And uh, we have a link on our website with instructions for reporting. All that to say is we wanna make sure that all of those individuals um, are able, or individuals in the county are able to report their results. I'll turn it over there, Mr. O'Donnell, to go in a little more detail because I know you had a deeper ask and then uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Stoddard to also uh, ask because he's been very instrumental in supporting this effort as well. If I can just pop in a follow-up question to that, um, sure. Mr. O'Donnell, I mean, are, are people using this portal? I mean, how many how many people are actually registering their results here? So uh, we're uh, I'll have numbers for you probably, hopefully within a few minutes. But um, if not, then I, I can send it to you shortly after uh, this briefing um, to give you an idea of like the weekly volume uh, of that. Uh, but but yes, we so we we knew that before. Go, going back before Omicron, um, there were people using rapid tests uh, that they purchased themselves. There were, uh, there were a, a, apparently a lot of clinicians were using rapid tests as well as part of, as part of their practice. Um, we know those weren't going into the numbers. So this has actually been happening for a while. We also, as we all remember, when we hit December, we hit the early part of the initial Omicron spike, and we did not have these numbers coming from the state. And we had to turn to our local county testing numbers. Um, so we've we've gone through we we've gone through periods of time where we did not have uh, the you know all all the lab providers uh, testing. We know we've never had that full picture. We also know that um, it only casts you know we're only getting data on people who get tested. So there's obviously more cases than what those numbers represent. The question is how much has it drifted with the very large distribution of rapid tests the county has done and with the greater access to rapid testing through um, through personal purchases. Um, so that that and then of all of that, how many people actually report those? We know they don't go into the uh, the state counts, uh, but and we also know that the reporting of it is is fairly low. We've been sharing with our provider community, um, ways that they can enter tests on behalf of their uh, on the behalf of their clients who you know they do a consult with them and uh, and then they want to report it but it does it doesn't show up in that number so we have to when we when we do these evaluations uh, we realize that this is only part of the picture going back to December we knew that uh, hospitalizations and ultimately deaths, um, uh, tell a, a more concrete picture of how many individuals are infected with severe illness. And we, we had a good, um, we had a good relationship between the test positivity and the eventual hosp hospitalizations. We knew there was a time, time lag, obviously. And the one thing we want to stress is, while the hospitalizations can be used as a metric, it's also something we're actively trying to prevent. And so, uh, we are looking at not only those PCR test results, um, not only how much contact tracing we're doing, which includes rapid tests. Um, our contact tracers can report rapid tests as well when they when they communicate with someone. Um, but we also track on, as we mentioned previously, outbreaks that are occurring in congregate settings. Uh, and following up on this week, I know we didn't mention it earlier, we have not seen an increase in the number of outbreaks in our county. We do track them in, in school settings. We track them in, um, in congregate living spaces. Um, there are outbreaks still happening across the state and in our county, but that the volume has not increased yet. And we will likely, to, because we do testing in, in those places, um, we're likely to see it there 
uh, and, and have a controlled week to week um, volume of testing that doesn't change uh, because of rapid testing. Thank you. And the only, thing, the only real quick thing I would add to that is we also have a number of Sentinel surveillance systems that have nothing to do with COVID that we utilize on a regular basis within public health. There's absenteeism data from Montgomery County Public Schools. There's absenteeism data from county employees. As, as Sean alluded to, there's outbreaks or investigations that are occurring in our nurse. So we have a number of systems that are agnostic to the actual COVID-19 testing results that tell us about some things about the community, about community health in, in Montgomery County that we can lean on. We've never throughout the entire pandemic had an accurate, fully accurate picture of the level of disease in our community because there's so much asymptomatic, so many asymptomatic cases, there's likely asymptomatic transmission occurring. There's so many of those things that we ne we likely never knew. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, there was no testing in the beginning. And so we obviously have had experience dealing with COVID-19 in the context of uh, aberrant testing volume and numbers. I think we're in a way better place now than we were back then relative to testing volume and capability. And the most important thing is, at rapid test aside, people reacting to a test result is way more important than us having the result at the back end. It's way more important that they take the test, even if it's at home, react accordingly. Obviously, I have just gotten over COVID myself. I have a family of five. We only had two people in my household get infected because we got the results early. We isolated and the other three people in our household remain never having had COVID. So um, obviously, you know, that, that can be done and, and that rapid test at home is the reason why we were able to, to isolate it in, in my household and, and across the county as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Rebecca, Mr. County Executive. We know you do have to go at noon. Kate Ryan from WTFP does have a question for you. Is that something you can take now? Yeah. Okay, uh, Kate, the question for the County Executive and then you can do the follow-up for the other officials. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. County Executive, and forgive me, I may have missed this part, Health officer, where are we with that appointment? I know the MCPS has named their chief medical officer. Um, what about the county health officer? Um, that That is still at the state level. And we're waiting to hear from them, I believe. I don't think anything changed since yesterday. Okay. Is that is this taking an inordinately long time at the state level? I, I'm asking because I have no idea typically what that would take. I would say, since we've never done this before, since I've been here, um, that I'm not sure what an inordinate amount of time is yet. Got it. It's also a different uh, secretary. It's a di I mean, so, uh, you know, I don't know what the circumstances were. I wasn't obviously in this position before, but I do know that there had, they, they've, the state has conducted one interview. I believe Dr. Chan met with the, with, with the nominee. Uh, the Secretary Schrader wants to meet with the nominee, uh, potential nominee before, and then obviously once that, once those two, one, one has happened, once the second one happens, then obviously we'll be in a position to proceed with the nomination and the county council. Got it. And I do understand that the county executive has to uh, uh, depart. I just had a, a couple of follow-ups um, to either Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, and you've answered these, a lot of these already, but again, in terms of um, what happens in schools. Um, is there a number that you're looking at that would say, okay, we've got to go back to either masks or tests? And at what, when once kids return to school, when are we looking for, uh, what's the timeline of, uh-oh, we have more numbers? Is it five days after they get back, 10 days after they get back, given the course of the, the illness? Hold on, before you answer that, Mr. County Executive, we know you do have to go. Thank you for joining us today. We'll Thank see you. you tomorrow at the okay. State of the County address at the Silver Spring Civic Center building at noon. See you later. Bye-bye. All right, the rest, <laughs> the rest of the officials know you can answer uh, Kate's uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So, okay, great, great question. We we will still continue to use the metric that's set forth by the Maryland Department of Health and M, uh, MSD regarding a percentage of cohorts or a number of cases not un unrelated in a classroom. They have not changed from that that threshold. Those measures will still be in place. As I indicated before, we're looking at a two week window where we will see a peak in cases. So we need to have a conversation with MCPS 
to assess where they are regarding those self-reported rapid tests or any reported PCR tests. Uh, contact tracing has changed. Uh, the MCPS will continue with their contact tracing efforts prior to any updates. All that to say is we need to have a conversation. We need to see what the community level spread and indicators are before we make any recommendation. We want to make those recommendations in collaboration, and then they will have to present it to their Board of Education before there's any reinstatement. And I would say uh, the only other thing I would add to that is, is that I don't I don't see it being, I don't know that it would be a system-wide decision, it may, it may but it, it also is, I think, more likely, that you you know, if you're going to see anything, it would be in, it would, based on the circumstances in individual schools, as was done in previous rounds, where they would make decisions based on the circumstances in, in schools. Uh, we'll meet with them, and obviously, they'll they'll make the decision around what they proceed, proceed to decide to do, but our hope is that with rapid testing readily available to families, that um, families can take on a significant role in preventing school-based transmission by simply testing their their students before they return their children before they return to the classroom uh, and the same is true of, of obviously faculty and staff as well and so obviously if if, if the parents of montgomery county uh, take advantage of the tests that have been provided to them i think we can return after spring break and have far fewer problems than we've had in previous returns to the classroom it just it relies on people taking advantage of the resources that are available to them and just not forgetting that COVID exists in their travels as well. Right. Sure. And, and, uh, and just to add, Kate, uh, to, to Dr. Stoddard, we continuously um, push information as part of that additive layered preventative measure. And uh, many students um, continue to wear their mask after the uh, mask mandate was lifted. And so we hope that that will continue in addition to uh, educational and testing information that we will work collaboratively with MCPS to pursue after spring break. Got it. And the test to return to school is a recommendation, correct? Not a requirement. Is that right? It is a recommendation. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Steve Bonnell, but that's the beat. Do you have any other follow-up questions, Steve? I, I do believe or not. Um, <laughs> the one COVID question I still have that I think is a central question that maybe others might have is, you know, obviously last fall when the mask mandate was in place, a lot of that depended on a metric that was tied just to counting cases. I think a lot of people are interested in when that's going to shift more or ex even exclusively to, we're going to let the, the level of hospitalizations determine what type of restrictions we'll put in place as opposed to case counts. So do any of you have any insight on a timeline there? I guess I'll just, I'll stop there before I blabber on. So, so Steve, I, we understand and recognize your interests so in comparison to last fall, we had the off-ramp and the on-ramps. We looked at substantial, uh, moderate to substantial to during Omicron and high to Omicron, we, in, we were in high community uh, transmission. We're using primary indicators and secondary indicators or levels, if you will, based on CDC's recent realignment. There is no metric. The primary metric and indicator based on community level is more than 200 cases uh, per 100,000, which is what we're seeing, I believe, in Arlington, Dr. Starter, where we see that they've gone from low to, to medium community levels, which required more additive or layered preventative measures. We won't see any recommendations, public health recommendations for a reinstatement of a mask mandate, indoor mask mandate, if you will, until we are at those high community level uh, transmissions, but also which impacts not only community levels, but individual and household levels. And that's where we see based on CDC's definition and recommendation and guidance um, in uh, mask uh, wearing uh, is required, especially for those who are immunocompromised or have chronic illnesses. What we're doing now at the county, absent of that 200 um, um, level threshold per 100,000 is we're looking at where we would be for medium and high level communications. I mean, community levels, I should say. So we're at low now, but we're looking at recommendations 
for medium community level, such as public health advisories indicating that, hey, there's community level spread, BA2 uh, is higher in the community. We strongly recommend that you wear a mask indoors, especially um, for congregate in congregate settings, you know, possibly other other areas such as schools, uh, correctional facilities as well. These are recommendations. These are advisories. These are not um, required uh, policies to be implemented, but it's saying that these are additive. So as Dr. Stoddard indicated, we build upon those additive, those layer preventative measures. And so that's the way we way forward now as compared to last fall. The only, the only thing I would also say is, uh, Steve, we need to be nimble about this, meaning um, it's one thing to, to make the, the, these, you know, to focus on hospitalizations in an Omicron-like variant. It is a totally different thing if the variant is much more, um, causes greater pathology, meaning there's greater, uh, greater translation of cases into hospitalization. If you wait until you see hospitalizations in the setting of a variant that has high morbidity and mortality, you will avoid it too long. And so obviously when we think about metrics, we need to be flexible enough to understand that it's one thing when we're doing with Omicron or BA2 and we know the characteristics of that variant to not translate that to COVID generally because other variants will have different characteristics, some of which, some of which will, may require different metrics and different thresholds for those metrics to, to, to act. And so I want to just be clear that when we talk about focusing on hospitalizations, that's much more of an Omicron specific um, uh, decision point, but it may not hold up for future variants or under different conditions. Here's the million dollar question then that I'm sure everyone, and I've already asked this before is, in your, all of yours views, when does this become endemic, I guess? Um, <laughs> well, it, it, it all comes down to consequence, right? If there's a if there's a high degree of consequence for our public, if both our hospital system and the people who live in it, then there, we still can't. You know, I, I'm not even sure what it means to treat something as endemic. Meaning, is that is that the phase where we just ignore it? If there's a condition in the public, endemic or otherwise, is that causes high consequence for our residents, we has a, we have a responsibility to pay attention to it and to act uh, to address it. Now, the, and I've said this multiple times before the, the county council and other circumstances, we, you know, we can't just be a hammer and everything looks like a nail, right? And so our response to COVID-19 has evolved and adapted over time as the circumstances and conditions on the ground have adapted. That will continue to be the case. Is there ever going to be, I don't say that there, there may be a day when we stop talking about COVID-19, but we're not at that day, and I'm not sure exactly when that day is going to arrive because it's, it's largely based on when, does, when is there not the same consequence for our residents as um, there is. We still, have, we, still have old, we still have older people in our community. We still have immunocompromised people in our community. We simply cannot, as, uh, as government or as a community, say good luck to those people. We're going, everyone else can ignore it. That's just, that, that is never going to happen. And so um, we have a responsibility to protect those residents as we would any other vulnerable population. Sure, and I agree with Dr. Stoddard, Steve. I think that our way forward as we continue to plan for not only any potential surges, subvariants, um, is to um, strengthen our education and our response, our public health response. We know that folks are tired, quite frankly. You know, we've had multiple conversations about uh, mental health challenges as a result of COVID, uh, fatigue, be it vaccine fatigue, hesitancy, or even mask fatigue. And so we want to repeatedly uh, re remind um, our counties of the efficacy of vaccines, the importance of mask wearing from a layer of preventative measures, but also not only mask wearing, but those public health practices, such as washing your hands. Folks have gotten away over the past couple of years. We haven't seen the level of flu uh, uh, cases reported, and I know Mr. O'Donnell about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, did an analysis based on his team on where we were at the state as far as uh, uh, vaccinations and immunizations from, from the flu. So we need to look at all public health variables 
And whether or not it's endemic, whether or not we are recovering, it will be around for a while. We need to plan. We're planning now for any potential fall surges. So looking at, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, uh, last month, uh, our PPE repository and what we're doing with, you know, mask and, and, and um, vaccine storage and rapid test kits and um, preparing for that. So that's the way forward. That's our next normal. That's how we are addressing any endemic state. If there's any endemic, you know, last year we were talking about herd immunity. Well, with 85% of the population that well uh, uh, surpasses any clinical or, or research um, uh, definition of acquiring some herd immunity as we continue to vaccinate more folks. We still have a, a six month a six month old, a under five or four year old um, cohort that we need to vaccinate. And so we need to protect them and get them vaccinated as well. And we're playing for that. So all of that is part of our public health framework, our response and recovery. A more right. concrete, one more, if you don't mind, Laura, one more concrete question. The federal TSA mandate for public transit, uh, transportation ends Monday. Now that could be extended, that's still in flux. Um, do you all have the authority to require masks on ride on buses yourselves? Um, and is that something you're considering? Yeah, so yes. I think that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Dr. So we have I think I just got the alert that it was extended, but go ahead, Dr. Sock. Oh, well then that even, okay, there you go. I do believe we have the authority to mandate them on county property facilities uh, and 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 in county services. We had not had the conversation at the point of this moment as to whether we would extend it absent the federal mandate. But obviously, if the federal mandate is going to be extended, we've paralleled that and would likely continue to do that. But we had we had right. discussed it before today. Breaking news there. You obviously don't have the reason I say it right on. You don't have the jurisdiction on Metro, right? That's Correct. all right. That would be up to Metro to decide. Although, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, they, 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 I don't know what they would decide, to be honest with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. I think we're done for the day. I do not see any more requests for questions from members of the media. Going once. Ooh, sorry, I have one. Oh, oh there is Rebecca. Done. All right, guys. Okay, Rebecca, go ahead. Washington Post. Sorry about that. Um, Dr. Sada, that was a, you know, fascinating what you talked about, you know, whether that the county is moving towards um, an endemic stage and on what that actually means. I've had the same question. Um, you said, you know, we, we can't move on quite yet, but, um, you know, given that there aren't really any major restrictions left with the exception of the masking guidance that, that you mentioned earlier, um, and, you know, people are gathering in Montgomery County as they are in other communities, haven't we in a way already moved on you know what what what's the difference of, of what we're doing well, we're still offering right pcr and rapid testing at our libraries and our rec centers mm -hmm. we still have a large number of staff and health and human services dedicated to offering opportunities for vaccination boosters and other, the other thing um we're still obviously still stockpiling ppe at a level that we have never stockpiled it at so um you know there are, there, we're still maintaining a capability. We're still monitoring it on a daily basis. And so I think when we talk about, you know, I, we, I don't look at flu numbers every day, certainly during flu season. I pay attention to our alerts when our hospitals are overburdened with flu. And we, you know, we, we have a blue alert that allows us to override some of, those, some of those capabilities. And we provide messaging when that happens. But certainly that, you know, flu is an endemic disease that we pay some attention to but not a ton and we don't you know obviously have an entire apparatus dedicated to you know responding you know to surges in flu in the same way that we do for COVID and I don't think we're going to discontinue to have that same capability in the short term certainly not I, I would imagine not through this you know we're gonna have to, through this fall and, and, and winter period so when I think of endemic, you know, when I think, when I, you know, I, I don't know what it means because I think people mean different things. They, I think most people, when they say endemic, mean when are we going to stop caring about COVID? And um, I don't know when that's going to be. But when I think of what, what it means to me is it's much more like flu where we know there's a flu season. Everyone, we encourage people to get flu vaccines, and but we don't otherwise think much about it. Um, I don't think we're at that stage of COVID-19 yet. That doesn't necessarily mean we're talking about going back to a more restrictive environment with masks or, you know, any limitations otherwise.
but we're still closely monitoring and offering a lot of resources to the public that we do not offer for other endemic diseases. Yeah. Dr. Stoddard, I'd, I'd like to, to agree with you on this and, and say, I, I do wish that if, if, if people meant, when are we gonna stop doing things to respond? They, they use that term rather than endemic. We don't define it as endemic. That is uh, the, the number of cases that you have per year. If, if it repeats long enough, it's, it becomes endemic. Uh, um, but again, going back to the chart we shared about, about seasonal influenza, uh, we shared that the first year, the deaths from COVID in Montgomery County were almost 10 times what we normally experience with seasonal influenza. And that's with a lot of, a lot of effort by the residents and the county to restrict disease spread. The second year, that dropped to four times the number of deaths of, of influenza. And I, I think we would want to see that continue to drop. And the way that'll happen will be a combination of this disease evolves into something that is more, that is potentially more widespread, but less severe in, in outcomes. And we have appropriate um, treatments and access to treatments that reduce serious outcomes and work against the variants. Um, and, and we have uh, available vaccines, again, that protect against a wide range of the evolving nature of this, uh, this disease. So, you know, when we have when we have vaccines, when we have therapeutics and access to our population and the, the disease, likely part of it will be, it evolves to a less uh, serious um, version uh, that, that outperforms the more serious versions, uh, we're likely to be at that point where the, the restrictions are, are not as commonplace. Um, and they, again, might still be focused on certain settings where we want to limit outbreaks. We will still want to limit outbreaks in nursing homes where people are more likely to have severe consequences. The same is true of influenza. And I think we've learned a lot um, over the last two years about how to try to reduce, um, reduce the spread of infectious diseases uh, that we'll, we'll likely use some of these in future years for influenza and other uh, infectious diseases, um, particularly the ones that are less invasive to, uh, to essential um, institutions of, of living. Um, but I, I'm, I, I'm willing to bet even when we, we have COVID numbers come way down, you'll see people wearing masks in the fall during influenza season to try to protect themselves from that. And I think just to add, we will continue to see uh, more clinical treatment modalities, more emergent therapies, more antivirals available that not only will treat respiratory illnesses um, like influenza and the coronavirus, but be more targeted um, in their in their approach. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, I, I, I thought you were gonna use the analogy that we used before when we talked about uh, endemic and using HIV, and then 40 years later, we're still using, uh, have antivirals and, and, and retrovirals and other treatment modalities as we continue to uh, respond to the virus or the changing or any variance in the virus. And so I think as we consider endemic, I think we can we look at it as a, a continuation of where we were two years ago, but more advanced strategies, treatment modalities information and education for the public, which makes our response um, uh, as maybe not as burdensome as it was two years ago, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, where we didn't have any test kits, where we had to go out and we had the fewest number of test kits, but more cases in the county. But now we're looking at other strategies that are more robust and more targeted. Very quick question. Uh, uh, just a clarification here. I know, Lorna, we're at like 121, so I want to get you out of here. But I, there was oh, a I to go now. Okay. All right. Let's get this last follow-up question. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So there was a lot of crosstalk, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Uh, Bridgers, uh, on the uh, ride on masking. What will the policy be once the federal um, uh, requirement uh, expires? What's the situation? What we were just saying is the federal, federal requirement was apparently just extended today, yes. just moments yes. ago. Yes. And so we had not had the conversation about what would happen if it hadn't gotten extended, but now that it's been extended, it seems like we're going to have a little bit longer to think about and decide what we would do at that point. But obviously what we would largely do is look at the conditions in Montgomery County, make a decision based on that. 
Um, you know, obviously, I think that would we would, we would want to be consistent with ride on, or with Metro in that case too. So I think we'd look at what Metro's decision would be, what the WMATA decision would be, and just go from there. We haven't obviously had that conversation yet, and it looks like with the extension of the federal uh, mandate, we won't need to for the short term. Can you talk about compliance? Sorry to jump in here, but you know, I'm speaking anecdotally here. When I go in the Metro on the weekends, it's not 100% of people that are wearing a mask. Now, I'm wondering what you all make of that. And is, if this is just honestly all, you know, it's a good faith, you know, people, it's the law. You have to wear a mask when you get in public transportation, what you're hearing anecdotally on that when it comes to ride on buses. Um, and just if it is really just a good faith, you know, with the public that, hey, this is the law, you know, you need to do this. Um, we have, I mean, we've seen pretty good compliance. I mean, actually, we still see pretty good no, number of people wearing them in grocery stores. And so, I think Montgomery County is a little bit different than most other jurisdictions and that we have a highly educated and generally um, pretty uh, conscientious population. Now it's not 100%, nor is it 100% even when we have mask mandates for indoors. Um, but I would say it's good uh, compliance. We haven't had enough, a large number of conflicts over it. We offer masks on the buses themselves, for people who forget. Um, I don't think we're regularly having conflicts where we're kicking people off of buses, you know, to, to, I guess to get to the to the no newsworthy point of it. So um, we're not we're not, you know, heavy handed in the enforcement, but I think we generally haven't had to contemplate being heavy handed because most people are just um, just follow the rules. Yeah, no, I would agree, Dr. Stoddard. We have um, a very uh, visible uh, signage posting regarding requirements, policies on our transportation uh, conveyances. And so I think, uh, not that I think I know our, our counties have been um, very responsive and um, and adhere to those policies and regulations. We haven't received any concerns um, uh, in public health regarding any uh, COVID uh, non-compliance, be it on public conveyances or at uh, uh, establishments throughout the county and, and, and our response typically for compliance is to increase education around the compliance policies and recommendation before there's any other stringent acts as Dr. Stoddard indicated. Did we break the record for longest presser yet? Thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank so. you Steve. I don't know. I don't think so. And with that, we're going to say good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, those of you at home, members of the media and county residents. We'll see you tomorrow again uh, with uh, the State of the County Address at noon at the Silver Spring Civic Building. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. <laughs>